Up on the bluff we saw the first dead Yankee. He lay stark and cold in death upon the hillside among the trees in the gloom of the gathering twilight. The pale face turned toward us, upon which we looked with feelings mingled with awe and dread. The Battle of First Manassas, otherwise known as the First Battle of Bull Run, was the first major battle to be fought between the armies of the United States and the Southern Confederacy. On the 21st of July, 1861, three newly formed armies clashed along the Bull Run Creek near the vital railroad hub at Manassas Junction in the plains of Northern Virginia. Battle forged the reputations of several leaders, tarnished that of others, forced hard lessons to be learned, claimed the lives of many, and removed any notion that the war would be a quick, bloodless affair. Using software developed by War Game Design Studio, we present a tactical analysis of the Battle of First Manassas, which depicts the battlefield with a north-oriented map and each hex representing 125 yards. From this vantage point, we cover the critical fighting at Blackburn's Ford, the Stone Bridge, Matthews Hill, Henry Hill, and Chen Ridge. After decades of internal tension aggravated by unresolved constitutional interpretations, the institution of slavery, and unprecedented economic and geographic growth, seven southern states seceded from the Union and formed the Confederate States of America, following the election of the Republican candidate for president, Abraham Lincoln. Peace was soon shattered when the newly installed Confederate president, Jefferson Davis, decided to fire upon Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor upon hearing that President Lincoln intended to resupply federal garrisons stationed there. The bombardment and subsequent surrender of Fort Sumter outraged the Lincoln administration, which promptly called up on 75,000 men from the remaining states to form an army to violently coerce the Confederacy back into the Union. However, Lincoln's call for troops caused four more states, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee, who were sympathetic to the notion of secession to also leave the Union. With 11 states already out and the loyalty of several more coming into question, President Lincoln hoped to quickly march an army south and defeat the Confederacy before the crisis escalated. In response to the impending invasion, Confederate troops quickly assembled to defend their new capital located in Richmond, Virginia, forming two armies to protect the northern approaches to the state. The Army of the Shenandoah, commanded by Brigadier General Joseph Johnston, protected the lower Shenandoah Valley from federal incursions. The other, the Army of the Potomac, commanded by Brigadier General P.G.T. Borgard, the hero of Fort Sumter, began constructing defensive positions behind the meandering Bull Run Creek, just 20 miles southwest from Washington, D.C., near a railroad hub known as Manassas Junction. Manassas Junction was a vital strategic asset for the Confederate forces defending Northern Virginia. It was here where the Manassas Gap Railroad broke off from the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. From the rail line running west along the Manassas Gap, troops and supplies from the Lower Shenandoah could easily be moved from Johnston to Beauregard. From south along the Orange and Alexandria, men and material from Central Virginia, Richmond, and the rest of the Confederacy were shipped north. With Confederate forces concentrating around Northern Virginia and in the Shenandoah Valley, Lincoln appointed Brigadier General Irvin McDowell to take command of the newly formed Department of Northeastern Virginia with the expectation he would soon march against the secessionist capital. General McDowell organized his army of 35,000 men into five divisions, commanded by Brigadier General Daniel Tyler, Colonel David Hunter, Colonel Samuel Hunselman, Brigadier General Theodore Runyon, and Colonel Dixon Miles, each containing between two to four brigades and several batteries of artillery. Amongst the infantry, artillerist, and cavalrymen was a battalion of U.S. Marines, which was attached to Colonel Hunter's division to fight as infantry. As McDowell assembled his army, 
Borgart's Army of the Potomac, numbering roughly 22,000 men, continued to prepare defenses along Bull Run Creek. Borgard had divided his army into eight brigades commanded by Brigadier General Millage Bonham, Brigadier General Richard Yule, Brigadier General David R. Jones, Brigadier General James Longstreet, Colonel Philip St. George Cock, Colonel Jubal Early, and Colonel Nathan Shanks Evans. Toward the Shenandoah Valley, another Union army of 18,000 men commanded by Major General Robert Patterson was situated near Harper's Ferry to protect against any Confederate movement towards Washington, D.C. through the lower Shenandoah Valley. Opposed to Patterson was Johnston, and his Confederate army of the Shenandoah near Winchester with slightly over 12,000 men divided into four brigades, commanded by Brigadier General Thomas Jackson, Colonel Francis Bartow, Brigadier General Bernard B., and Brigadier General Edmund Kirby Smith, as well as around 300 cavalrymen under the command of Colonel James Ewell Brown Stewart and a brigade detached from Beauregard commanded by Brigadier General the Phileas Holmes. As McDowell assembled his army, he came under increasing pressure from the Lincoln administration and the northern press to begin an invasion of the Confederacy. However, McDowell was worried that his army lacked the training necessary to perform successfully on the field of battle. The majority of his men were new recruits who had little training outside of regimental drill and tactics. Further compounding the issue, Few of his commanders had any experience leading units larger than the company level, let alone regiments, brigades, or divisions. Still, Lincoln persisted, reminding General McDowell that the enemy faced the same obstacles in training. You are green, it is true, but they are green also. You are all green alike. With a Union army gathering around Washington, General Beauregard entrenched his army along an eight-mile front behind the Bull Run Creek. He anchored his left flank with Colonel Evans's brigade behind the stone bridge where the Warrington Turnpike crossed the Bull Run. Just south of the stone bridge was Colonel Cox's brigade, which guarded the Lewis, Balls, and Island Fords. General Bonham's brigade protected the Mitchell's Ford. To the east, General Longstreet's brigade covered Blackburn's Ford with Colonel Early's brigade in reserve. General Jones's brigade protected the McLean's Ford further downstream, while General Ewell protected the extreme right of the Confederate line, near where the Orange and Alexandria line crossed the Bull Run at Union Mills. Despite having to defend multiple fords between the Stone Bridge and Union Mills, only Mitchell's crossing was large enough to sustain the movement of an army allowing the Confederates to easily cover all approaches from behind earthworks. On July 16th, General McDowell cajoled into movement by repeated cries of, on to Richmond, from the press and the Lincoln administration, began his march southward. He hoped to demonstrate against the Confederate front line defenses along the Bull Run Creek with a supporting effort while his main effort outflank the enemy from the south, forcing them to withdraw from their defenses and abandon the Manassas Junction. The next day, General McDowell's army drove away a Confederate screening force around Fairfax before later arriving in Centerville. Located just north and east of the Confederate defenses, that same morning, having determined that the Union Army planned to attack along the Manassas line, General Borgard sent a telegram to General Johnston requesting that he reinforce the Confederate defenses at Manassas. Behind a heavy cavalry screen, the Confederate Army of the Shenandoah marched from its position around Winchester toward Piedmont Station where it would move by rail to Manassas Junction. They had successfully given the Federals in the valley the slip. Just after General Johnston's army departed, General Patterson sent a telegraph to Washington stating, I have succeeded, in accordance with the wishes of the General-in-Chief, in keeping General Johnston's force at Winchester. Meanwhile, hoping to find the Confederate flank, General McDowell ordered General Tyler's division to conduct a reconnaissance in force by marching from Centerville to investigate the area between Blackburn's and Mitchell's Ford. However, he was to avoid a general engagement. 
Colonel Israel Richardson's brigade took the vanguard and cautiously advanced to Blackburn's Ford, where they were met by Longstreet's brigade of Confederates entrenched south of the Bull Run. The ensuing skirmish was marked by confusion, as the Union soldiers, some of whom were wearing gray uniforms, struggled to engage their elusive foe. The Confederates likewise struggled to maintain command and control, failing to organize a successful counterattack to drive back their enemy. Eventually, Confederate reinforcements from Colonel Early and the Washington Artillery convinced General Tyler that further assaults were unnecessary, and the Union forces withdrew to report their fight. Although the skirmish was brief, with 83 Union casualties compared to 68 Confederate, it convinced General McDowell that the Confederate right was too strong and that he would have to devise a new way to outflank the Rebel Army. Following the skirmish at Blackburn's Fort, the Union commander then dithered for two days while deciding how to proceed. However, time was running against him as every moment brought additional time for General Johnston's army to reinforce General Beauregard. Further complicating the issue was the fact that many of the 90-day enlistments in his army were about to run out. He fearfully wrote to Washington, In a few days I will lose many thousands of the best of this force. After hearing reports from scouts that the Confederate left flank was vulnerable, McDowell devised a genius yet complex plan. He would send Tyler's division to demonstrate against the far left of the Confederate line at the Stone Bridge while Richardson's brigade pinned down the Confederate right. To the north, Colonels Hunter and Hunselman would march their divisions on a wide flanking march across Sudley Springs Ford to get in the rear of the Confederates. If successful, McDowell's plan would either force the Southerns to withdraw from their defenses along the Bull Run or cause them to be defeated in detail. The plan was not without risk, as it relied on several units acting in concert while spread apart by several miles. Still, with proper coordination, victory was possible. The men were to begin their march in the early morning hours of the 21st. As the sun set on the evening of the 20th, men on both sides contemplated their own mortality. Colonel Bartow tried to encourage his men. Remember boys, battle and fighting mean death, and probably before sunrise, some of us will be dead. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.